section of SSRIs, especially with regards to why the therapeutic effect is delayed when taking the medication. So let's jump right into what happens at the neuron level when you take an SSRI. So we know that SSRIs target neurons that release serotonin, and that's because these neurons contain a reuptake transport protein called SIRT. And SIRT is just short for serotonin transporter. I think of reuptake transporters as kind of like mini vacuums that suck up the neurotransmitters back into the cell. So when you block SIRT, we know that serotonin lasts longer in the synapse and then can act longer on whatever neuron it's hitting because the mini vacuums that suck the serotonin back are being clogged by the SSRI. So now I'm going to walk step by step what occurs when you take an SSRI so you have a better idea of why it takes four to six weeks for a therapeutic effect to occur. So we know that when you take an SSRI, the SIRT receptor is blocked and almost immediately serotonin increases, but really only in the somatodendritic region of the neuron. And the increase in serotonin isn't as much in the axon terminal. So this immediate increase in serotonin explains why there's immediate side effects when you start the medication. Some people incorrectly think that because SSRIs take four to six weeks to have a therapeutic effect, that means that any effect before then is just in the person's head, which is just not true. People can feel different immediately after taking the drug, but the effect on the depression typically takes four to six weeks. So patients aren't nutty if they say they feel an effect in just a few days because there is that increase in serotonin in the somatodendritic region, which is associated with an increase in jitteriness or just kind of a different feeling. So with this increase in the somatodendritic region, we know that the increased serotonin acts on presynaptic 5-HT1A receptors. So we know the presynaptic 5-HT1 receptors are what are called autoreceptors. And their job is to cause a negative feedback loop in signal transduction. So that means that they detect the serotonin and their function is to control internal processes to decrease the further release or synthesis of the serotonin. So through biochemical communication, the 5-HT1A receptor kind of has a conversation with the neuron. So I imagine you take the SSRI and then... A few moments later... So the 1A receptionist says, Yeah, you know, there's a huge boost in serotonin in the back. We're getting completely crushed back here. And the front office manager thinks, All right, no need to get the boss involved. This will go away with time. I'll just release the same amount of serotonin in the front. But of course, the person continues to take the SSRI, so there's still that increased activity at the 5-HT1A receptors. So the third thing that occurs is that the increased activity of the autoreceptors causes them to downregulate. So essentially, the information that the 5-HT1A receptors continuously have been getting activated, that information is sent to the cell nucleus of the neuron, and the genome's reactions information is to issue instructions to the cell that causes the receptors to become downregulated and desensitized. So in my head, the way this conversation occurs is, you take the SSRI and then... Four to six weeks later... In more than a month, I'm going to get slammed every single day. You gotta do something. So the CEO of the cell, which is the DNA, recognizes it just makes more sense to decrease the number of 5-HT1A receptors. So now that the 5-HT1A somatodendritic autoreceptors are desensitized, serotonin can no longer turn off its own release. So this means that the serotonin neuron is no longer inhibited, which results in the last step, which is the increase of serotonin release from the axons and an increase in neuronal impulse flow. So to summarize, while the presynaptic HT1A autoreceptors are desensitizing, this leads to an increase in the serotonin buildup in the synapses at the axon terminal. And it is believed that this increase in the axon terminal is what's responsible for the therapeutic effect. So there's a delayed disinhibition of serotonin release in the key pathways that impact depression. And we also know that a lot of the side effects are a result of the acute action of serotonin at undesirable receptors in undesirable pathways with regard to depression. And we know that these side effects decrease over time by desensitization at those particular receptors. And now I just want to have a few closing remarks about all the stuff I just talked about. I just want to remind you that neurochemistry is largely theoretical. When I was young, I would think that these theories would develop because they had some super microscope and they were picturing all these things occurring, when really it's just a model of what's occurring. So that isn't to say that it's incorrect, but just that this is way over simplistic. And in reality, a million things are occurring when we take the medication, and this just helps us organize how to think about it. We have to remember that the popular notion that SSRIs correct the serotonin deficit is largely a myth. The real answer is probably just that SSRIs cause some change in the brain, which causes another change in the brain, and eventually leads to improved symptoms of depression. So the change is not really the direct effect of the drug, which occurs right away, but a downstream effect of the brain's reaction to the drug, which is a little bit slower. So a more humble way of presenting the information is just that 
we believe that the changes in depression has something to do with the changes in gene expression. And this is likely driven by stimulation of the serotonin 5-HT1A receptors, which ends up resulting in increased synthesis of various proteins and increased synthesis of eventually BDNF. So ultimately what I'm trying to say is use these models to help you organize the information and help you remember the information, but also be humble and recognize that they're just simplistic models and they're not perfect. Remember that this is looking at depression through only a neurochemical lens. When in reality, we know that there's also cognitive changes and psychological changes taking place at the same time that can't really be understood through the lens of neurochemistry. All right, thanks for watching.